Now recently, the Daily Mail put out a report of 30 things, 30, 30, 30 things that fathers are no longer teaching their children in this generation. Here they are. Number one, building a treehouse, making a catapult, catching a fish, going crabbing, repairing a bike puncture. Just uh, while I'm going through this, just ask yourself, did my dad teach me how to do this as well? Using a compass, catching tadpoles, building a fire, looking at stars through a telescope, reading a map, playing poo sticks. Do you know what poo sticks is? How many of you don't know what poo sticks is? Give me a wave. I didn't know what poo sticks either was either. It sounded really uncomfortable to me. Uh, Pastor Stewart, stand up. Tell us what poo sticks is, please. Uh, poo sticks is from the book Winnie the Pooh, just to clear that up really quick. And uh, it's where you stand on a bridge with the water running underneath it. You drop it in it the, where the water starts from. And then the first stick to get to the other side of the bridge wins. Really? So we're going to do that in Salford later at the, Salf at the um, Lowry Hotel. Is that, that, what's that bridge called? The Lowry Bridge. Cent whatever it's called. Centenary Bridge. Poo sticks, identifying birds. That's easy. That's easy. Like the Julie, Zoe, that's easy. Was that bad? Where's my wife? Is that bad? Is that bad? Bad, okay. If you want to complain, send an email to glimbarrett at idontcare.com, okay? Um, <laughs> pitching a tent, pitching a tent, learning the countryside code. Basically, shut any gate you walk through. Um, growing vegetables. Who grows vegetables? Who grows the vegetables these days? You grow, Tara, you grow your own vegetables. You have a husband, you have twins, and you are growing vegetables. Wow, that is amazing. Bring me a turnip sometime, a pumpkin or something like that. Learning the names of trees, using jumpers as goalposts to play football in the park. Now, come on, that is a coming-of-age thing. If you never did that, you didn't really have a childhood. Tying a tie. Give me a wave if you don't know how to tie a tie. Give me a wave, let's be honest. Okay, give me a wave if you don't know how to do a Windsor knot tie, a Windsor knot. Sparky doesn't know. Okay. Um, polishing and buffing shoes, sex education, washing a car, building a den, playing conkers, making a daisy chain, which I've uh, got to be honest, my dad never taught me how to do that. My sister did. Making a good cup of tea. Now, there seems to be a dilemma from the last service because for me, when I make a cup of tea, it depends if it's a teapot or if it's a tea bag. If it's a tea bag, then the hot water goes in first. You then take the tea bag out and then you add milk second. Am I right? However, I am of the opinion that with a teapot, you put the milk in the cup first. How many of you agree with that? How many of you disagree with me and need Jesus in your life? I'm not going to argue with you. You're a black belt in Taekwondo. Um, uh, skimming a stone, learning to manage money, whistling a tune. Uh, honestly, we, we actually are of the opinion that Sparky down here on the front row should put out a worship album of whistling because it is quite amazing. He's so good at it. My wife, on the other hand, baby, just run over here, will you, for a sec? What are you doing? You're doing an Instagram story. Insta Live. Hello, everybody watching on Insta Live. This is uh, Glenn, and, and you're about to see my wife whistle. In fact, come up into the light because this is really worthy of. <laughs> Go. Wait there, wait there. Sparky, come on up here for a second. Would you just put Sam on the seat there? Sparky, could you just teach my wife to whistle, please? She's really good at whistling the loud thing. The come here whistle, aren't you? <whistles> See, redemption. And th <laughs> number 30, um, no, number 29, how to swim. Number 30, how to tie a good knot. We, we want to just spend a few moments with you in this service. I've got 18 minutes and 30 seconds to do this, to talk to you a little bit 
about legacy. Talk to you about legacy, the importance of legacy. Before we do that, we need to go backstage and see how they are doing in this IKEA building project. So Radek, how is it going backstage? How, how's it looking back there? It's going very well at the moment. So as you can see right now, we've got everything laid out in a very orderly manner. Now, what we're doing now is obviously we're following step by step, making sure that as we basically assemble this, you know, particular piece of furniture, we've got everything ordered, all the screws, all the plastic elements, all the wooden elements, and we've got wow. our tools in here as well. So the key is that you keep your workplace well ordered at all times so you don't basically miss anything and everything goes all right. So no pressure, but in the last service, a young girl put it together. And it was really firm, it was really stable. And uh, you're, you're from Poland originally, so let me ask this question. Are, are, the, are the instructions in Polish as complicated as they are in English? No, they're not, because inst instructions are basically just pictures, so they are great for any language, really. Pictures? Yeah. All right, so you've showed me up on stage. Shut up. Okay, turn <laughs> the camera off. I want to talk to you for a moment about legacy. Legacy. My dad, my dad, sadly, he passed away 22 years ago and uh, caught us by surprise. He was 61, he was healthy, he was fit, and, uh, and, and passed away really suddenly. But, but when he passed away, my dad left me a few things. He left me nearly 10,000 theological textbooks. He left me all of his sermons from 40 years of preaching. And also, he left me a little bit of money. Not a lot, but a little bit of money. Now, usually when we think about legacy, we think about what we are passing onto the next generation. But I want to suggest to you today in church that legacy is more than just what we pass onto the next generation, but what we pass into the next generation, what we convey into them. Because to be honest, of the 10,000 nearly books that my dad passed on to me, I don't have many of them left. I left most of them in Australia when we moved here and others that I've, I've given away to, to different places. Uh, of the money that my dad left to me, got to be honest, we don't have much of that left. I want to encourage you that what you pass into the next generation will always live on much longer than what you pass onto the next generation. What you pass in will actually outlive your life. I am actually, in, in, in many ways, a product of what my dad passed into me and the greatest legacy I think I can bring to my children and certainly the greatest legacy that Sophia and I can leave with you, Audacious Church, by the end of our tenure as your pastors, whenever that may be, will not be the stuff that we've passed onto you, but the stuff that we have imparted into you. And I think that's really what legacy is about. More than just passing on, it's about passing in, what we can deposit into you. Before I get into three aspects of legacy that I think is important that we pass into the next generation, I think it's worth highlighting Psalm 68 verse 5. Speaking about our God, it says this, that God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in His holy dwelling. And what I find fascinating with this is that God, who could present Himself in so many ways to each and every one of us, He presents Himself as a Father. And I think there is a little bit of a challenge with God as a Father in today's age, because for many people who've had maybe a difficult experience with their Father, maybe their Father was absent, maybe He was cruel, whatever it may be, the idea of seeing God as Father is sometimes filtered through our earthly experience of our Father. Recently, I was talking to somebody who said to me, Glenn, I understand, I've got a good understanding of Jesus as the Son, and, and I understand God, the Holy Spirit, but the concept of God being a Father is lost on me because my earthly Father really was not a good Father, nor was He a good man. But make no mistake here, in Psalm 68, God presents Himself as a father to us, a father who is in his holy dwelling. Why does he do that? I think the reason he does that is con to convey to each and every one of us who are fathers, that we are fathers not because we got biologically lucky, but we are fathers because we have been commissioned by God with a holy commission to be so. 
Can I say to you today in church that to you dads out there, that your fathering is a holy commission. That God set something upon your life, something within your DNA, that He would set you apart with this holy commissioning to be a father. I want to encourage every dad in the place today, every dad watching online, that your fathering is not a lucky thing. Your fathering is a plan and a commissioning from God, something that we need to take very, very seriously in Jesus' name. It's interesting because research, latest research tells us this, that when a father relies solely on the local church to bring a child up in spiritual ways, that something is often missing in that child. In fact, research tells us this, that when a dad comes to church a minimum of three out of every four Sundays, then that child has got a greater propensity to grow in the knowledge of God. In fact, when a father refuses to allow the brilliant youth group or brilliant children's ministry to take sole responsibility for the spiritual raising of the children, when a father takes a spiritual role in the house, then the children begin to grow strong in the ways of God. I want to encourage you dads in this house today. Be a father in this house. I want to encourage every single one of you men to be a father in this house. I want you to know you can be a spiritual father. That even if you have no biological children, you can become a spiritual father. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 to 16. It says, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. I became your father. And I know that in the life of Audacious Church, that there are children that we have growing up in this house who's for whatever reason, dad is is not around and we honour single mums in this house today. You play the role of mother and father. You're amazing. And we're praying that God will continue to strengthen you, give you wisdom and peace as you guide your sons and daughters in the ways of God. But I want to speak to every male in this place as well and let you know that actually we can all play a part of being a spiritual father in this generation. We can all do that. He goes on here and he says this, therefore I urge you to imitate me. And this is where I believe Paul is speaking more than just what we pass onto the next generation, but about what we pass into the next generation. Three aspects of legacy that I think are important today. The first one is this. It's what I'm calling faith legacy. I believe it's our job as men in this place to pass on to the next generations a faith legacy. And when I speak of faith legacy, I'm speaking now about courage. Courage for this next generation to live great, to be great, and to pursue their dreams in Jesus' name. A courage legacy. Just 20 seconds of insane courage. I think that sometimes what can happen in this generation coming through is that a lack of courage comes through comparison with others and a fear of failure. And so because of comparison outlined in social media, because of a fear of failure, we at times end up with with, with people who are afraid to have a go. But I wanna encourage you, what would happen if we just taught our children to have courage, to actually have a go? In other words, I'm talking about, yeah, you can climb that tree. Yeah, you can run on that wall. By all means, kick the ball. I think that the danger with what we're knowing as this snowflake generation coming through is this, is that we end up in a mode of what psychologists call um, helicopter parenting. And helicopter parenting is the parent who hovers like a helicopter all the round, all the time around the child and intervening in moments where there's an obstacle or a problem that comes in the way. And so we as parents keep our children from those obstacles. We keep them from those potential problems instead of allowing our children to have the courage to have a go. They say the pro of helicopter um, parenting is, is the parent gets a lot of time to be spent, a lot of time spent with a child, but the con, the negative is this, is that we keep our child from being courageous and having a go. What would happen 
if we as men and as women encouraged our children to have a go, to step out of the boat, to actually pursue the dreams that maybe our children feel they have for their lives. It's a dangerous thing because in school, when I was a child, I was often taught not to daydream. But I believe we should be encouraging our children to do that very thing. To actually spend those moments where they stare off into the distance and begin to dream about what life could be. To actually have a go. Oh, wouldn't it be brilliant if our children coming through had this hallmark of not being a snowflake, but being courageous? Where no longer do they have fear of failure or fear of failure through comparison, but our sons and our daughters are having a go. Or as Winston Churchill said, he said, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. Oh, to give our sons and daughters courage in Jesus' name, I believe is such an important thing. The second aspect of legacy, I believe that we should be passing into our children is that that I'm calling relational legacy. Relational legacy. Or if you like, their identity in God. Have a look at this picture coming up on screen right now. This picture... Uh, doesn't mean anything to any of you, but to me, this picture means everything. This is a pool in the city of Toowoomba, Australia, where I grew up, and this pool is called Millen Bay Pool, Millen Bay Pool. It's an Olympic-sized pool. It is 50 meters long, and, and that grandstand that you look at as a, as a picture captured in the 80s means nothing, but that, that grandstand seats around 1,000 people. And it was in this pool in 1984 when things went wrong in my life. I'd been in high school for just three weeks. I had the opportunity to represent my house in a swimming carnival, my house in the school. I had four schoolhouses. Mine was Thompson House. I was in Centenary Heights State High School. And there I was three weeks into my high school career. I stood on the blocks at the end of the pool there. The gun went off. I dived into the pool. And little did I realize that when I got into the pool, my swimming shorts fell off. And I swam butt naked in front of my whole school. Now, I was tanned everywhere apart from here. And these little white butt cheeks floated across the top of the water to the end of the race where I touched the end, you can't see the end, and I got third place. And I was pretty excited, but you can imagine my embarrassment when I realized I swam butt naked in front of a grandstand of people, people around the edges, and not only did I swim one leg, but they made me swim back and get my shorts in front of the whole school. It's a problem when things happen that are external to you. And I think it's a danger in life for our children when they end up identifying themselves with some external thing that took place or a feeling that they have. They end up being tagged. Actually, swimming butt naked wasn't the worst day of my life. The worst day was the next day riding to school knowing that I was now the butt naked kid. I was tagged by it. I was identified by that. Graffiti artists do this. When they're graffitiing walls, they call it tagging, and they tag things, they identify things. And I want you to know that in the lives of your sons and daughters, they are constantly being tagged by society, tagged by external events, tagged by the way they feel, neither of which are satisfactory or good. But I want to suggest to you in this service right now that the one who tagged you first, the one who tagged your children first, has prior right to define who you are and who your sons and daughters are in Jesus' name. You see, before any of our kids were born, before you were born, the Bible says this, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I have set you apart. I called you. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Can I say this over your kids? Can I say this after you, that the one who tagged you first has prior right to identify and define who you are. 
You are not your sexual orientation. Hello. You are not your academic status. Hello. You are not according to what set you're in, in science or maths or English. You are not what school you graduated from. You are not the color of your skin. You are not the church that you go to. You are not the nation you come from. I'll tell you who you are. You are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. And the one who tagged you first has every reason to identify who you are. Folks, can I be so bold as to say enough of the nonsense? Come on, enough of the nonsense. These external factors and feelings that we use to identify who we are. I'm a victim. No, you're not. You're a daughter and you're a son of the Most High God. I'm this academic qualification. No, you're not. You're a son and a daughter of the Most High God. And this is what we mean when we talk about relational legacy. Sophie preached an amazing message some years ago about people who come in, uh, identify themselves. In fact, baby, come on up here for a moment. Give me a bit of a snapshot on I Am Fear, the song that you sing. My name is what? My name is, my name is, and how people... Okay, it was a few years ago. Um, That we are not what happens to us, that we are not, um, we're not, we cannot identify ourselves with something that either we learned or that, that can be taken away from us. If we look at all the labels in our lives, usually we label ourselves with things that we are to others or things that we have learned or things that, that can be taken away from us. So, for example, if you lose your job as a, as a lawyer or as a... Does that mean that you cease to exist? No. The identity that we have as sons and daughters of God is given to us. We do not acquire it. We do not go out and discover it. We do not work it out. It is given to us by God Himself. And that identity can never be taken away from us. So I'm not fear... I'm not unemployed, I'm not depressed, that, none of those things identify me. What identifies me is who I am in Christ, in Jesus' name. And I think it's a beautiful thing for us to teach our sons and daughters who they are in Christ. The last thing is this, I have 10 seconds to do this, the last thing is this, is emotional legacy. I believe that not only should we impart to our next generation a faith legacy, courage which is what I believe this new church building we're building is all about. It's about courage. It's about something that stands for the next generation of what this generation did. We stepped out, we were courageous in Jesus' name. I believe it's about imparting relational legacy, but it's also about imparting to this next generation, passing into them emotional legacy. And when I say emotional legacy, I mean being here. Fathers and mothers who were present with their kids through the journey of life. We're talking about emotional legacy. In other words, being being here, being in the moment. And uh, you know, I'm I'm reading the papers like you all. I read the news online and there's a lot to be said about a generation of fathers who are and have been absent at times, citing social media, citing this digital world. But you know, before social media, before the digital world, we had TV, of course. And then before that, we had newspapers. And there's always been that sense where from one generation to the next, there's been challenges with fathers being present. And even now, as I'm looking around, I see a lot of people nodding as you, I guess, reflect on your life. And for some of you realize that dad just wasn't there at different times and at different seasons. Maybe he was absent in entirety. I think the emotional legacy of being here is so important. This is why I speak to every single man in this place to let you know that, you know what, there are some children and young people growing up in Audacious Church that don't have dads at home. You can be there for them. You too can pray about it and you can kind of identify with a family where maybe you can become a father in a spiritual sense to them. I believe that's possible. And I know that already happens. Be here. An emotional legacy to be there. Stories told about a young girl called Rachel. Rachel was just a, a little one, just, just really, really little, maybe, maybe four, maybe five years of age. And every night she struggled to sleep. 
She was going through a season of having really bad dreams. And so every night she would wake up in the middle of the night and not call out to mum and dad, but run into mum and dad's room. And she would crawl in between mum and dad. And because mum and dad were on either side of her, she could fall asleep. And it, I guess, conveys to us a beautiful picture of safety and really the role that parents we should play for our children. She did this every night for, for weeks, moving into months. She would crawl into bed with mum and dad. But on this one particular day, mum was going away for business for 24, 48 hours. And Rachel would be at home with her dad. So dad said to her that afternoon, he said, hey, Rachel, he said, tonight, instead of you waking up tonight and coming into bed with me, he said, when you go to bed and fall asleep, why don't I come in tonight and sleep in the corner of your bedroom on the floor? Little Rachel thought this was a great idea. So she said, that'd be great, Dad. And so that night, Rachel goes to bed. Dad sneaks in later on at about 11 o'clock. He, he makes a, a makeshift bed in the corner of the room and he falls asleep on the floor. He woke up early the next morning before Rachel woke up, went downstairs to make her school lunch, to, to prepare breakfast. And that morning, Rachel wakes up, she comes downstairs and, and Dad said, Rachel, congratulations, you slept the whole night uninterrupted. That was so brilliant. And Rachel said, Daddy, that's because you were there. To which his dad, her dad replied, well, Rach, how do you know that I was there? Because I came in after you went to sleep and I left before you woke up. How did you know I was in your room? And she said, oh, Daddy, don't be so serious. Don't be so silly. Don't be so silly. You told me you would be there. Here's what the Bible says. Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you you go. So our God in heaven who presents Himself as a Father, He actually passes into us this faith legacy. Be strong and courageous. He passes into us this relational legacy. He gives us an identity in Him. And He also passes into us this emotional legacy. He's a God who's not just over there, but He is Emmanuel, God with us. And my prayer for each and every one of you across this place today is as dads and those mums who are playing the role of father at home, that we would pass these things into the lives of our children and our children's children in Jesus' name. Because more important than the money and the house you leave behind is what you impart into the next generation in Jesus' name.